As always, it is good to be here in the house of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and for your grace. God, we thank you for loving us, for sending your son to take our place on the cross and redeem us, Lord. We pray that this morning you would be lifted high, Lord, that we would be humbled by your awesomeness, by your grace and by your mercy for us, Lord, and that our hearts would worship you. Have your way. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able, let's go ahead and stand for this first song. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. All He did, and now to His temple draw near. Gracious Father, we're, we're very pleased to be here today, Lord, to get to worship you and to sing your praises and just to commune with you. And we ask, Lord, that you would guide us by your spirit and, and help us to hear your voice today. Lord, be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Well, welcome you guys in Jesus' name. Why don't you uh, be seated? Got a couple of announcements for you. First off, I'd like to thank all of you that uh, came to my daughter's wedding yesterday and, and helped us with it and stuff. It's just a total blessing. And uh, we, we rejoice uh, at having such an awesome church family, and uh, thank you for that. Uh, on, a, on a different little note, though, um, it was a bittersweet kind of a day, um, <clears throat> sending our daughter off, but also, many of you know the, the Folk family, Joe, uh, Fred and Joe Folk, and uh, Grandma Carmela. Uh, she graduated into heaven yesterday, and uh, so we rejoice for that, but we also grieve with the Folk family and keep them in your prayers. And then this coming Sunday, actually not this coming Sunday, is it? No. Got two Sundays to go, but uh, uh, June 6th, we're going to have our worship and communion service in the morning services, and then June 13th, we're going to have a, a, a baptism 
after the second service, and so there'll be a barbecue potluck to follow the second service. And if you're interested in getting baptized, uh, please let me know. We'll, we'll get you squared away, and uh, looking forward to having that together. Then we've got the men's breakfast coming up on the 26th. And then um, looking a little farther ahead, uh, September 11th is going to be the um, uh, 2021 Calvary Chapel Women's uh, Conference at Little Country Church that we have uh, just about every year. <laughs> I say just about because of COVID. But uh, anyway, looking forward to that. Gene McClure is going to be the uh, keynote speaker, and uh, we're going to have information out about that pretty quick. But if you've got questions, you can talk to, to Grace or Deb, and, and they'll get you squared away. And then uh, women's prayer this week, because we're taking off for a few days. Uh, women's prayer is going to be at Deb's house at uh, 7 a.m., and if you need to uh, figure out how to get to her house, then uh, she's right there. You can talk to her later. And then uh, women's discipleship is put off this week till the following week, and that'll pick up again then. And then uh, we're going to begin the uh, Friday night worship uh, uh, fellowship again, uh, and I'm looking forward to that very much. Uh, so we're going to have the first one Friday night, June 4th, 6 o'clock at the Schufert's house, and uh, bring some finger food if you like, but basically it's the time where we just get together have some fellowship, and we just spend the evening worshiping. And so uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a squared away cool time, so I encourage you to come check that out. Father God, thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for, again, Lord, for the opportunity to worship you. We ask that you would guide us and lead us as you will. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to worship. Our 
I choose to worship, I choose to love. Through this pain in the offering, I lay it down. Here in the conflict, the wind doubt surrounds. Though my soul is unraveling, I choose. Sing that again. I choose. I choose to worship. I choose to love. Though this pain in the offering, I lay it down. Here in the conflict, the wind out
when my world comes crashing down, I lift my praises high till the darkness turns to dawn. I lift my praises and I choose to worship. I choose you now. I choose to worship. I choose you. good when life is not you will always and forever be my soul Lord God I pray that we would choose you when the enemy's pressing in Lord when there's trials when we are in the midst of the valley you are worthy still of all praise, all adoration, all glory. Lord, I pray that you would forever be our song. And praise the eternal. And praise the of a trial right now, if you were in the valley, if you were on a mountain high, choose to worship, choose to praise him, choose to lift his name high, because he is worthy of all praise, all adoration, lift his name high, let's praise the eternal, praise the eternal. Praise the
gracious Father, we stand here this morning in awe of who you are. And we praise your holy name, Lord, and we ask that you be glorified. Have your way in our midst today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, welcome. Why don't you go ahead and turn and greet each other real quick. Hi, Sherry. <laughs> Well, we're very glad to have you guys here with us this morning, and uh, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, have my son George come up, come on up, George, and teach. Uh, he was the youth pastor here for a season, and uh, he's on staff currently down in the Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, and uh, just a blessing for me to get to sit and hear my son as he instructs us in, in his God's Word, so come on up, George. All right. Man, what a... A warm time of worship. That was, uh, I liked just the, everything about being in here this morning. It's like, man, it's so nice to be with Jesus this morning and to be with his people. Uh, and I've been enjoying kind of catching up with some of the faces that I used to know that I, uh, you know, I'm sure I look a little more ragged and a little more worn. I'm not saying that you guys do, but I do. So I don't know what that speaks of you guys, but we'll just let your imaginations run wild with that one. Um, this morning, so I want to talk to you guys about something that, that may seem uh, fairly basic, fairly elementary. This is a, an adaptation of a class that I've done down at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, uh, and it's about missional Christianity. And so to start off with, I, I would pose the question to you guys, uh, what is your role in the mission of God in the world? And I'm not expecting, I mean, you guys could shout out answers if you wanted to, but just just ruminate on this idea of what's your role? What is your part personally? And I don't mean, I mean, there's the broad brush of the church's part, but what is your personal part in this interactive thing that God is doing in the world right now? Um, I want to start with uh, this quote uh, from John Stott. It says, world evangelization requires the whole church to take the whole gospel to the whole world. And I, I really like that, um, the idea of the whole church, because it's too often, I think, that we get this idea that there are certain people in the church that do this, and the other people simply are in a support role. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with a support role. I think there's a, there's a, a tremendous amount of glory in a support role, and part of that is your guys' tithes and offerings, not only to this church, but even to missions internationally, and that's a, a tremendous way to partner but, uh, but I would submit that there's, a, there's an even more personal role for every single one of us that are called into this family, this body of Christ that, that we've been uh, adopted into. Uh, so this, this statement from John Stott comes from the Luzon Covenant, and uh, I would encourage you guys to, to check it out. It's actually a much longer statement. It's kind of a defining evangelical document from a bunch of different leaders from back in the 70s. It's a really, really good uh, kind of paradigm to look at evangelical Christianity through because, as you guys know, the definition of evangelical is often changing rapidly, uh, and there's not really one single uh, definition that everybody agrees upon, but this is a good starting point. But today I want to talk about missional Christianity, and what that means is that ordinary Christians are called to participate in the mission of God in their ordinary lives, their everyday normal lives. So not all Christians are called to become missionaries or pastors vocationally, but every single Christian, uh, the church collectively and the church individually, we are a sent people. We're intended to be a sent people. We were saved to be sent. And this is easily seen, this is a key theme throughout the New Testament. You see this over and over again with the believers that you read about, the people that Jesus interacted with, Jesus himself, and we're going to talk about his life a little bit, but there's an intrinsic sentness to the church. It's core. It's in our DNA. It's a foundational idea. So the idea, again, is not that we would partition the church into the sent ones and the staying ones, but that we would all be sent. And the key concept to this is that wherever you are is where you're sent. Wherever you are is where you're sent. Now, uh, that's not to say that you'll never be sent anywhere else, but right now, right where you are at is where God has you, where he has placed you. 
and, uh, and, and we can see this throughout Scripture, but um, this, this should change, as we talk about this, this should change the perspective that we have about our normal interactions on a day-to-day -day level with the people around us, whether that's you know, at the post office, at the grocery store, in church, uh, in traffic, <laughs> the way that we drive, the way that we just do life is supposed to be affected by this identity that we have now received as part of the body of Christ. So at the outset, uh, I want to define some key terms, uh, and this is, this is kind of, oh, it's a little, little formatting issue there, but there's, there's three points here, and these are not exhaustive definitions. Uh, hopefully, this, this will create a kind of framework for us to understand how we would approach missional Christianity in our lives. And so I want to start with these, these concepts of mission, of missions, plural, and then of missional. So again, these, aren't, these, aren't, uh, these definitions aren't just agreed upon across the board, but I want to help you guys understand the concept, the foundational concept of mission, and understand how the missio dei, or the mission of God, interacts with our personal lives. And then uh, I want to help the followers of Jesus effectively impart the gospel into their relationships, and not just into those gospel conversations, but into every conversation. It's just a part of who we are. So participating in the Missio Dei is for all Christians. Again, this is not reserved for a minister class, and that's a, that's a problem in the church today. Um, and, you know, I don't know everybody that's in every church all the time, so I'm not saying it's everybody's problem, but predominantly the work of the ministry is done by the vocational ministers, the pastors, the guys in the pulpits, and a lot of the church is content with that. You know, just let the, the professionals handle it. Uh, but I want to I try to work this into our personal lives. So let's talk about mission. Okay. So mission refers to God's intention and his actions toward reconciling all things in heaven and in earth in Christ on the basis of his life, his death, and his resurrection. And uh, the key concept of this comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. If you have your Bibles, you guys can turn there. We'll be bouncing around a little bit, so you have to be quick on the draw. But if you've got pens and ink wells and stuff out, don't worry about spilling it on yourselves. I'll, I'll put most of the verses up. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, I'll have most of the verses up as well. Um, but Ephesians, 9, or Ephesians 1, 9 and 10 says, uh, Making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to... Unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. So there's three layers of the, uh, the mission of God. When we talk about missio dei, mission, the mission of God, there's three layers of reconciliation that are at work. There's the reconciliation between God and man, this kind of vertical relationship, uh, this bridging the gap through the man, Jesus Christ, and through his, his work on the cross. There is also... A reconciliation of relationships between humans and humans, man and man. You, you and your neighbors can now be reconciled through the gospel. Uh, and then there's a, a reconciliation that actually permeates all of the cosmos because there's a destruction that permeates all of the cosmos that came when sin entered into the world of humankind. Uh, a destruction began, and God is reconciling that destruction, that chaos, that brokenness, and that's the, the, the kind of global brokenness that you can read about in the newspapers. God is at work reconciling those things in and through Jesus Christ and through his church. So that's a, that's a key concept there. It's not just the work of God himself divinely as he's reconciling these things. He is divinely using his church, his spirit-filled body of believers to accomplish these goals as well. So the Missio Dei itself will be completed one day. And I think that's a, that's a hope for all Christians. That's a hope really for all of creation. Even, even the earth itself is hoping for this time when the earth is completely healed and reconciled. Creation is made right. Every wrong is made undone. Turn with me in your Bibles uh, to Revelation chapter 21 in verse 1. And if you guys are ever just feeling bummed out and, uh, and heavy, reading your newspapers, reading Google, reading Yahoo News, whatever it is that you're reading, and you just feel like, my gosh, this earth is dying and broken, and I'm stuck here, uh, 
this passage is such a breath of fresh air. I just love it. Revelation chapter 21, starting in verse 1. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And verse 5, And he who, who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. I just love that passage. Um, that, uh, I, don't, I don't believe in some kind of a heavenly uh, memory wipe. I don't believe that we'll go there and forget everything that was done here because that would include the redeeming work of Christ in our lives, the redemption of brokenness and sin and pain. And we will see those things revealed in their fullness and we'll say, God, you're big and you're great. And these things that, that broke me, that brought me tears, now bring you glory. And we'll see those things come to fruition. That's going to be an awesome time. There's a, there's a quote from a, a book by a, a guy named Cornelius Plantinga, uh, and it's a, a wonderful quote. It's a tiny little, uh, little text behind me. I don't know if you can read it, but I'll read it out loud. But, but he's speaking about the Old Testament prophets as they would write down their prophecies and imagine what God was actually going to bring to pass as far as Israel, as far as the population of the world, as far as the earth itself. Uh, in, in his quote, he says, those prophets kept dreaming of a time when God would put things right again. They dreamed of a new age in which human crookedness would be straightened out, rough places made plain. The foolish would be made wise and the wise humble. They dreamed of a time when the deserts would flower, the mountains would run with wine, weeping would cease, and people could go to sleep without weapons on their laps. People would work in peace and work to fruitful effect. Lambs could lay down with lions. All nature would be fruitful, benign, and filled with wonder upon wonder. All humans would be knit together in brotherhood and sisterhood, and all nature and all humans would look to God, walk with God, lean toward God, and delight in God. Shouts of joy and recognition would well up from valleys and seas, from women in streets, and from men on ships. The webbing together of God, humans, and all creation in justice, fulfillment, and delight in what the, is what the Hebrews call shalom. We call it peace, but it means far more than mere peace of mind or a ceasefire between enemies. In the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight. A rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts are fruitfully employed. A state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior open doors and welcomes the creatures in whom he delights. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be. Man, doesn't, don't you just resonate with that? When you look out in the world, the world is not as it's supposed to be. It's broken. And, and that's not just out there. Even as you look in the mirror, it's in here. There's a reconciling work of Christ, a, a renewal that's happening. But we see great, great brokenness. It's comforting to know that God's not blind to that. And more than that, it's comforting to know that God has a plan for that and challenging for us, part of that plan is to use us here and now towards this. As, as I read that, some of those things probably shot off in your mind. You're thinking, wait, we can do that now. Yes, <laughs> that's the point. We are supposed to be doing that now, living in that now, bringing about that now, because that's exactly what the Bible teaches our role is to be doing as empowered by the Spirit. But the biblical idea of shalom, you hear that word a lot as a, as a greeting. You know, you guys who have been to Israel, shalom. Yeah, you know it, you get it. But this idea of shalom is not, as, as uh, Cornelius Plantinga points out, it's not just a, a, a word that means peace. It's an entire ecosystem of wholeness 
and wellness that only spring from God. And that is exactly what he's doing right now. So God began that work through the person and the reconciling work of Jesus, but he's continuing that work now through the Holy Spirit, through the church, and through Christians. So Missio Dei, the mission of God, that's for this study, we're, we're calling that mission. So the next phrase that I want to talk about is missions. And missions uh, we'll use to refer to people engaging in and participating in God's mission by doing evangelism, disciple making, and church planting among unreached peoples wherever they happen to be. So some of the mission of, of this church right here is towards prison ministry. There are unreached people in the prisons, and the radio actually gets through there, and people get saved. That's awesome. But there's also unreached people, I guarantee it, in the grocery store line. There's unreached people at Starbucks. There's unreached people that live right next door to you, above you, maybe below you. There's unreached peoples all over the place. So this idea of missions uh, does not mean that you have to go out to another country. It can but it doesn't exclusively need to mean this. And what's, what's interesting is, statistically, there's more Christians in the global south right now than in the global north. So as you're thinking about South America, Central and South America, you're thinking about Africa, you're thinking about Southeast Asia, there's actually more Christians in those areas than there are in North America, in Western Europe. Uh, it, it's just kind of incredible right now how the globe has, in a, in a way, been kind of flipped but what's also interesting about what's happening in the globe is, as my brother can totally attest to, there are unreached people groups, where countries that you can't go to. Uh, you just can't get in. God has brought massive populations of those people right to our shores. Maybe not directly here to Susanville, but in Southern California, there's huge numbers of people from places we just can't go to. Places like Iran and Iraq and, and these Middle Eastern countries where, where uh, it would be impossible to go and pass out Bibles and, and tracts they're coming right here, and that's because of jobs and work and the promise of a better life. That could be being displaced by wars and famines and those sort of things, and they come as refugees. Either way, God has done something really, really unique. Even, uh, even through COVID, God has done something really, really unique in making people far more reachable than they have ever been. And in a sense, because of COVID, far more hungry for friendship far more hungry for relationship and opportunity to just be together as humans, as people. So it, we live in a, a really, really unique, unique time. So global missions, uh, they, they shouldn't stop. I'm not saying we shouldn't, we shouldn't just stop traveling. But uh, for those that are not particularly called to travel, you're still called to missions, and there's still plenty of opportunity right here. And the, the key text for this would come from Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, as we call it. Uh, you know, there's the idea of go therefore and make disciples, but, but really, uh, the inflection here in the Greek is as you are going, make disciples. So there's, there's actually an intended, like, so you guys are going, and as you go, make disciples. You know, it's not just, okay, so some of you guys are going, be sure to make disciples. No, this is, and, and this is not just to the apostles and those bearing the apostolic mantle, or even evangelists, technically, because technically, we're all evangelists. So th this great commission really is a great commission for all of us to make disciples of all nations, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe the things that Jesus commanded us to observe. Uh, and then there's the promise that he'll be with us as we do it. And that's, that's something that I definitely want to impart uh, as we talk about missions, is that we are partnering with God. We're partnering with Jesus uh, he's not sending us to do it alone. So those are the broad concepts, but then a little bit more narrow. Sorry about the formatting, guys. It's a little squished here. PowerPoint, um, this was an export from Keynote to PowerPoint, and sometimes things just get a little pinched. But anyway, um, so when I'm talking about missional Christianity, uh, being a missional Christian means that you think of yourself as sent. And more than that, as an essential part in God's mission, the Missio Dei, in the world. And to view every sphere of your personal life as a mission field. 
So that's a, a little bit different way, you know, even as we think about eschatologically, the end times are coming and all of these things are happening, we're still supposed to be looking uh, not, not simply to escape this world, but to bring as many prisoners as we can with us from this system of brokenness and death. And so the, the, um, the missional Christians understand that the church collectively and individually uh, are both a consequence and a catalyst for the mission of God. So the mission of God, God reached out to humankind. He formed a new relationship and a new way for relationship through the work and person of Jesus Christ. And then he's made a new community of people who identify themselves as God's friends and family, right? This new relationship forms the basis of a responsibility. Uh, there's an expectation when you get saved and I know, you know, there's this whole debate, oh my gosh, are, are we saved to be free? Are we saved for works? Uh, uh, Paul would say that we would use our freedom to serve one another. There's a service expectation in our newfound freedom, but there's also an evangelism expectation with our newfound freedom. We don't just take the keys of life quietly to our graves. We pass them out. We tell as many people as we possibly can, friends, family, uh, you know, there's a, there's a sick, broken world. Even those antagonistic to the gospel must hear it. Uh, we wouldn't wish anybody, uh, on anybody, the destruction that comes without a relationship with God. And so that, that's the impetus. That's the catalyst. Now, now that we have this relationship, we want to tell other people about that relationship. So in what we do is God saved people. We're sent. So we need to go and we need to share. And there's, there's plenty of passages. John chapter 20 uh, is a great passage about being sent. Mark chapter 8, uh, verses 34 and 35, great passage about us being sent and not just the, uh, the, the ministers. So with this idea, there comes kind of a, a series of paradigm shifts. And, and a paradigm is, is basically like a core perspective. It's a, a worldview or the way that you interact with everything outside of your eyeballs. That's a, a paradigm shift is just going to change in a foundational way, the way that we approach life. And so I want to talk about um, foundational changes that are essential to Christians uh, as we're called to the way of Jesus so we want, to be, we want to be used by him to reach those who don't have Jesus. So um, again, it's not a niche calling for just the few, not just for those people that are ordained or have been through Bible college or whatever. It's for all Christians. So the first paradigm shift that I want to talk about is moving us, and I'm including myself, all of us, we need to move from being spectators to ministers. And that's just how we approach life. We don't wait for the, the, the work of the ministry to be done by somebody else. Uh, the missional mindset um, is, is, according to Scripture, every follower of Jesus is a minister of the church and is called and gifted to help the church mature into the character of Jesus. So uh, evangelism isn't primarily about Christians inviting non-Christians to the Harvest Crusade or, or necessarily to church services where professional ministers can have their way with them. <laughs> the, the, the primary goal for evangelism is for God's people to be the ones doing the interacting with God's non-people, with the people that are not friends with him. Uh, so a missional mindset understands that church leaders are the equippers, yes, but the church members are the actual ministers. If you guys would, turn with me real quick to Ephesians chapter 4. This is such a, a key mentality shift when it comes to uh, being sent and being called to go and to speak about the gospel. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And he, being Jesus, gave apostles, prophets, and evangelists, shepherds and teachers, and what's the purpose? To equip the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ. Isn't that interesting? So, so he gave these different offices to help raise people up so that they would do the work of the ministry. Isn't that interesting? It's definitely the smaller percentage of people in church right now are the vocational ministers. How many paid preachers does a church have? Uh, and then uh, what's, what's the ratio of preachers to people just coming in? Now that 
you can see the, the instant ratio of the power of God going out into the world if every single one of those people that comes into the church is going out sent out. That they're the ones that are actually doing the work of the ministry. If you, if you want to talk about the heavy lifting, it's the many hands in the church, not the few. So the few, yeah, my, my position here, my role here, my dad's position here is to fire you guys up, raise you up, but then go talk to the people that we don't get to talk to. Go talk to the people that we don't live by. And yeah, you want to invite him over to go talk to your unsaved family or friends? They don't know him. They'll listen, sure, they'll be polite, but they know you. And there's a power there in knowing who you are. Maybe there's a power in seeing that transformation in your life. But God has placed you as like a, a sleeper cell. You're like the perfect fit for the context that you live in. Consider that. We're not the perfect fit. You are. So we want to raise you up and send you out so that you guys do the actual work of the ministry. So the second paradigm shift that I want to talk about is moving us from being a receiver to being a builder. And this, this even comes to uh, the way that we attend church. Missional Christians understand that participation in local church is not primarily about receiving from others, but giving to others. Now, I know that uh, most of you guys came in here to hear a message here, the word taught, um, but I don't know if you, you guys realize that your, your maybe primary duty coming here was to encourage and engage with the Christians that are right around you. And we, we want to help you. Again, we want to assist you. We want to help raise you up. But you guys, you guys build up each other. You guys are foundational pieces. And that encouragement can't just come from a single person at the front. It has to come from the whole body acting like the whole body, acting like a whole human body, interconnected, flowing into each other, engaging with each other, empowering each other, encouraging each other. Uh, we, are, we are directly responsible for the maturity and the growth of each other. That's, that's how this is. This is a mutually beneficial family that we're in now. Uh, and it doesn't just come from, from uh, pulpit down. It, it flows horizontally into each other because we're now part of this body. So we don't want to be consumers treating the church like a restaurant where we just come in and get our bowl filled and then leave. Um, we don't want to think about the church even being a geographical location in this town or in any town. Uh, really, you know, there's the, the fancy kind of uh, uh, theological word ontological, and that means basically that the idea of what you are, what the church is. And if you cut the church open, what it bleeds out is what it is, right? If it bleeds out structure, then the church is structure, apparently. And there's, there's truth to that. But I would say more than that, if you cut the church open, it bleeds out us. Because we are the church. We form the church. We make up the church. Um, there's a, a, a great, uh, <laughs> this idea here is that the church is a people among whom all individual followers of Jesus, with all of our baggage, with all of our wounds, with all of our garbage, we have a God-enabled contribution to make into each other's lives. And that comes directly from Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 6. Uh, there's a song that I, I really like from a, a band that I really like called Thrice. Um, it's an old song, but they talk about how every scar is a bridge into someone else's broken heart. There's a, there is an incredible healing power that Christ flows directly through our hurts into the hurting. Um, so the, the third paradigm shift that I want to talk about is uh, that we're moving from object of mission to catalyst of mission. So we haven't just received, you know, the, the missional Christians understand that part of the reason why they have been given the rescuing and renewing love of Jesus, of God through Jesus, is to become a conduit through which the same love can flow into others. So we're not just saved to be saved. You know, it's a, it's a pretty core concept to Christianity. Uh, we're saved so that others can be saved as well. The, the, the way that God works through us in this partnership. So having become an object of God's redemption, we have an invitation and a responsibility to help other people experience God's redemption. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. I was just talking to my dad about this yesterday. But starting in verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 
For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we're afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope is that you, uh, our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Isn't that wonderful? The way that God designed this church to work, to flow that comfort directly into us divinely, and then for us to equally divinely allow the Spirit to bring that to bear in other people's lives. We're, we're really here for each other. It's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting perspective on the church. So there's some motivating principles for missional living. Uh, and just by way of review, we are sent on mission just like Jesus. So he's not asking us to do anything that he totally didn't do completely. Like Jesus poured himself out entirely for this idea of missional living. So not not everybody is going to be called towards international living, but all Christians are called to be active witnesses of Jesus. John chapter 20, verse 21. There's no getting out of this one, my friends. Uh, Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Exactly the same program that he signed up for is the program that we have been signed up for as part of the body of Christ. So wherever we are, that's where we're sent. So you guys don't need to bang your heads against the wall trying to figure out where you're sent. That's a nice thing. You're already there. (laughs) Unless the Lord wants to interrupt you and send you elsewhere, you're right where you're supposed to be. And that's, a, that's an encouraging thought. Maybe, uh, maybe it's a confounding thought, but Jesus has, has made a keyhole into the community that's shaped just like you. Um, so the immediate context of every Christian is the sphere of their missional calling. So wherever you live, so the, it's, it's your community context. It's your relational context, the people that you know, the friends that you have, the people that live around you, your vocational context. You work somewhere that I don't work. You get to talk to people that I don't get to talk to. Jesus has sent you there. There's the circumstantial context. Sometimes, you know, you pull up on the side of the road by somebody that's got a blown out tire. Maybe that's an opportunity that God has opened a door for you to share the love of Christ and the message of the gospel with. Uh, So there's opportunities all around us. And the cool thing about this is that God wants these opportunities to be highlighted to you. So as you pray and ask God, Lord, show me these opportunities, the relational ones, the ones in my community, the ones at my job, the ones that just spring up out of nowhere. Uh, We talk about divine appointments, and God is really into those, but I guarantee you he's actually a lot more into it than you think he is. So he's got you right where you're supposed to be. So... um, We're saved to be sent on mission is the third point there. We're saved to be sent on mission. And this this actual, this idea comes through this meta-narrative of the Bible. If you jump all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, there's the cultural mandate where he's telling humanity, I want you guys to multiply. I want you guys uh, to go out and cultivate. I want you guys to bring order to creation. And in a sense, you guys, that is the great commission task given in the Old Testament. That he's saying, I, I have made you for a relationship with me. Now I want you guys to multiply that love relationship with me and partner with me in cultivating this uncultivated planet. Have you guys ever thought about uh, that, uh, the, that work was needed in the garden? Why would work be needed in the garden if the garden was complete? Have you ever thought about that? Like, what are they working at if everything's perfect and ready and, and going? You guys, the, the world that Adam and Eve looked at was much like the world that we look at. It needs cultivation. It needs order, and it needs to experience the love relationship of men and God and men with each other. Humanity. Humanity with each other. God wants to spread this thing out. So ultimately, God didn't make humankind necessarily so that he could serve them. It wasn't just an opportunity for him to show love, and it wasn't necessarily that they were made simply to serve him so that they would show him love. God initiated a relationship of love and partnership with humanity from the very beginning. This idea that that Jesus is saying, uh, I'm not going to leave you or forsake you. I'll be with you to the end of the age. Uh, Think about this. There used to be a centralized place of worship and encounter of God. That was the temple in Jerusalem. That's where you could actually go from anywhere in the world and go and be near the presence of God. And what has God done now? 
He's absolutely decentralized the center of worship and presence into every single believer. Every single believer is now a temple of the Holy Spirit. So the presence of God is now, it's not dissipated, it's spread out into the entire world wherever Christians go. So again, this idea of multiplying, of cultivating, guys, that's, that's our job. That's exactly what we're called to do. We're, we're called to the same exact thing. We're bringing shalom. The idea of shalom, we're bringing that into the world, into creation right now through Jesus, and he's doing it through us. It's an incredible thing. First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 10. You guys are familiar with this one. It says, you are a chosen race. We have a new racial identity. You're a royal priesthood, a completely new job, a holy nation, completely new identity, a people for his own possession. But why? He says here, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, verse 10, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received that mercy. And now I think we understand, what do we do with that mercy? We turn it around and pour it out into the people that are right around us. The idea that, that proclaim, that you may proclaim, it's an ex angelio. It only happens in scripture one time, but it's the idea of making known through praising and through proclaiming. Isn't that great? That we make God's character known through our praising of him. And that's not just with our mouths, that's not just with our songs, it's with our actions and with our lives. So Christians have a responsibility to actively tell others the gospel when God gives them relational open doors to do so. And sometimes you guys, know, you know exactly what I'm talking about because I've been there uh, probably way more times than I'd care to admit, where I see God absolutely opening a relational door and me going, I don't really want to touch that. <laughs> I'd rather like somebody else be raised up. <laughs> and God's going, that's you, buddy. So God places these things in our path. So we're not merely to enjoy God and enjoy the fellowship of one another while we sit back and watch a Christless world go down in flames. We're to be active participants in this. So I want to talk about Jesus as our missional prototype. Again, he's not calling us to do anything that he himself would not do. And, and in, in the Bible, our ultimate example of missional living is Jesus Christ himself and the life that he lived throughout the New Testament. Every relationship and every season in Jesus' life was shaped by and leveraged for the advancement of God's mission to renew all things in him. So what did Jesus do? You know, some, some things that Jesus did, he personally sacrificed of himself to model missional life. And that doesn't just mean the whole, uh, you know, foxes have holes and, and all of that stuff. Jesus was homeless. No, the eternal third person of the triune Godhead sacrificed the comforts of his eternal home and the rights as a divine son and traded them for a life of servitude suffering, and ultimately death. Why did he do that? He did that both to redeem mankind, for sure, and to leave us an example of the kind of missional and selfless living that should shape the attitudes, values, actions, and the words of his people. So what he's done to secure our relationship with God is meant to radically transform the way that we do relationship, the way that we do friendship, the way that we do family, the way that we do neighboring uh, with the people around us. Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 to 11, it says, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. So this idea of otherness, looking to the people outside of us, have this mind among you which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not, count it equality with, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself to become obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross." Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of, the God, uh, of God the Father. So Jesus' exaltation is directly 
an outpouring of his servanthood. Him coming to serve has led to him being given this name above all names. He's, he's modeling for us, not just accomplishing the means by which we can be, be saved, but modeling for us the way that we should be living and how we should be doing relationships. He left his home. Think about that. He, he left his eternal home. He left his relationships, his, his place of comfort. He, he, he came to clearly embody and explain the character of God and his gospel love toward us. Uh, he chose to descend to the earth and live a life of mission, not merely as an example of how to live, uh, but was also intended to be sort of a, a living letter. He's really explaining the heart of the Father and the, the character of God by doing all of these things. And in that same way, we embody that mission of being this living what the Father is like, what God is like, what relationship with him can be and can look like. So there, there are some snapshots of Jesus' life uh, where he is in missional action. And, uh, and these things, um, it's interesting how Jesus repeatedly and relationally engaged uh, with those in society that uh, culturally, politically, and religiously, the leadership of the day would consider those sorts of people that he, he hung out with the worst sort of people, the most undesirable sort of people. Him interacting with such undesirable people was considered and still would be considered today a deeply scandalous thing for a rabbi, for a religious guy, for a Christian even. It would be incredibly scandalous. It's, it's important to note that the following uh, snapshots, they, they depict Jesus interacting with people in everyday settings. You know, Jesus wasn't interacting with people um, at, at the, in front of the stage after an altar call when everybody got saved or wasn't interacting with them in the fellowship hall of a church. He was interacting with people in the highways and byways. He was interacting with them at feasts and in, at, at weddings. He was interacting with people just walking around, wandering the wilderness, going fishing. I mean, he used every single opportunity as a time and a place to teach people about God and about the Father. So uh, he, he didn't really centralize around religious gatherings or, or church events which is interesting. So the, the primary place where Jesus did ministry was out there. Again, this equipping for the work of the ministry to send you guys out there. So um, let's see. Uh, being missional like Jesus requires connecting to those who need him in the places where they are found, not primarily at Christian gatherings and events. As we look at each one of these quick uh, vignettes, it's important to ask ourselves uh, these are challenging things. We need to ask ourselves, do these kinds of uh, experiences and attitudes uh, characterize my approach to Christianity? And this is not simply a challenge for you. This is a challenge for all of us, for myself. As I, as I consider Jesus and how he did stuff, do I do stuff like him? As, as he approached his, his perspective, does that, is, is my perspective reflected in what he did or how he did it? So we can start here uh, with the woman at the well, and that comes from John chapter 4, verses uh, 7, really through verse 27. But Jesus, in John chapter 4, verse 21, he engage, engages this, this woman from Samaria. Uh, he says, give me a drink. Uh, his disciples had gone away to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Two counts against her. Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. And then in verse 27, when his disciples came back, they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking to her? Jesus interacting with this woman required him to go way outside of the church walls, way outside of the Christian community, way outside of acceptable community. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> the religious and cultural and social norms of the day were all just kind of thrown up in the air when he even engaged with this woman, let alone uh, made her the evangelist to her village. It's an interesting flip where Jesus interacts with somebody he should not be interacting with, and then she turns around and declares the oracles of God to the people that need to hear it most. What a powerful interaction for Jesus to cross that social, racial. I mean, that was a racial line, but he crossed that with that simple engagement of, can I have a drink? It's amazing. Uh, it, it's amazing. And it's funny how that sounds like such a, such a culturally primed moment for anger and aggression, and that Jesus just moves right through that with grace. Even talking to her was an act of grace. So um, though he never committed any sin, he was very, very willing to risk the disapproval of people 
and to break cultural and social uh, barriers and rules uh, to reach the broken people that needed his love. Now that, that's a cue for us. So the next one, Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. That's a good one. Everybody knows this one. But uh, Luke chapter 5, verses 30 to 32, And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not called to come the right to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus was way willing to risk uh, falling out with the, uh, the religious leadership of the day to risk disapproval and even to scandalize the religious Jews of his day to reach those people that society had kind of cast off. He came to see the very people uh, experience forgiveness and restoration, uh, to, to see their honor, their dignity in God restored, their image of God to be completed in that conforming work of Jesus, that yielding to his spirit. He wouldn't allow man-made religious restrictions to stop him from redemptive purpose. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus simply liked to upset uh, worship of God to do these things, and it like suddenly pits Jesus against Moses. No, this is pitting, pitting Jesus against culture, because the rules of the Pharisees, while informed by Moses, were absolutely legalized by the Pharisees uh, to a degree that it was removing the grace and the mercy out of the worship of God, and Jesus was restoring that. Oftentimes, very, very uh, apolitically, just walking right through these, these things. So the third one, uh, Jesus drank and ate with drunkards and gluttons. This is a good passage. This is a challenging one. Luke chapter 7, verses 31 to 35 to what then shall I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge, and you didn't weep. John the Baptist came eating no bread and drinking no wine. You said he has a demon. The Son of Man, Jesus, has come eating and drinking. And you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners." Yet wisdom is justified by all her children. To, to the dismay of the religious elite, Jesus didn't mind associating with the rejected of society. And his eating and his drinking offended a lot of people. It, it, it did. It put him at odds with the scribes and with the Pharisees. Um, but as he describes it, the way that he did ministry in this way, in this relational way, was the way of wisdom. That, that, that it was justified by, by uh, its children, bringing people into relationship with God. Fourth, Jesus attended weddings and festivals. You know, we have the wedding feast in Cana. Jesus went to a wedding, and he used it as an opportunity to show the work and the love of God for his people. It wasn't just a social gathering, but it was a social gathering. And that, that's a key thing, that uh, Jesus didn't practice a joyless, sectarian, monastic kind of sad version of the good life. You know, he's like, this is the good life. Join me. I hate everything. Join me. You know, like Jesus was actually, not only did he go to these social gatherings, think about this. He was the sort of guy that people wanted at social gatherings. Isn't that interesting? And it's like Jesus over there in the dark corner with his arms crossed. Look, at look, everybody's laughing, but there's Jesus, all grumpy. Jesus was actually somebody that you wanted to have around and invite to. Um, but he had no problem attending festivals and, and those kinds of social gatherings. Uh, next, Jesus engaged, uh, Jesus engaged the sick and the ostracized throughout the Gospels. Matthew 4, Luke 14. Jesus loved, touched, healed, and spent time with the poor, with the desolate, with the diseased, with the cast-offs of society. That was like his bread and butter, if you will. When he, when he spent time with them and healed not only their sickness, but their brokenness and their sin, man, it went out. And people heard the gospel. They heard where salvation came from through those poor people's lives being turned upside down and, uh, and in a sense, improved in every way. Uh, uh, he didn't only spend time cultivating a following among the wealthy, among the academics, among the religious intelligentsia of the time. He spent time with the low, with the broken. Uh, his commands to his followers to continue these emphases in ministry of spending time and doing those times in ministry, those prevail for us. That we're called to do ministry with those sorts of people, not just the people you know, that we would consider on our peer level. Um, doing so 
spending time with those people, guys, Jesus didn't just drive through the bad parts of town and wave out the window. He got to know people. He got out there and he touched them. He hugged them. He held them. They touched him. He ate with them. They ate with him. It was a, a very, very immersive relational ministry. But, um, but he welcomed them into his midst, and, and in the same way we ought to welcome those in our midst. So I think that's what we need to ask. Uh, do these kinds of experiences, do these kinds of attitudes, uh, do these characterize my approach, our approach? Is this how we, is this how we approach Christianity? And this is not meant to make everybody feel bad, like you're such rotten Christians. Why aren't you being missional or whatever? No, this is more of, okay, what's the biblical idea? What, what, what does the church, what is the church? Not just the things that we do, but what are we? So part of this is to look at this as the ideal to live towards, but part of this is to radically apply day to day. And the question that we should ask is, do we? Do we do ministry like this? Do we do life like this? Because, guys, as, as we talked about here, life is ministry. And it's ministry to your families. It's ministry to the, to the people you love. So, so the family doesn't just get the cliff notes and then everybody else gets this wonderful life of love and gospel proclamation. You guys, they should get it first, for sure. But then it shouldn't end with them where the only people that ever hear the gospel are your kids when you strap them down to the, the chair and like, okay, you're, you're gonna hear the gospel. Uh, your, your, uh, your mailman uh, should know uh, where the hope of Christ comes from. <laughs> uh, the, the people on social media should know where salvation comes from. Uh, it doesn't come from, from morals. It doesn't come from politics. It comes from the man and the ministry of Jesus Christ himself. And they need to hear that. They need to hear that. Uh, so there's some, some very, very basic, very practical steps. Usually, the, you know, as I do this class, there's a second part where we talk practicals. But, um, but I'll just throw some of these out here real quick because these are really, really easy ways to apply uh, missional Christianity to your everyday life. And they're going to sound super stupid basic. You'll be like, what the? Did that? That's not what I signed up for. Well, you guys didn't pay money for this, so it's all good. Um, <laughs> but I just have nine, nine little, little tips, nine little, little opportunities that you guys can have to live missional Christianity. And it's not rocket science, and it's not deep theology either. Uh, the, first, the first one, point number one, is get to know people's names. Just get to know people's names. I don't just mean here at church. I mean in your neighborhoods. Many of you probably already do, but you have no idea how effective that is in opening relational doors, opening opportunities for you to have a barbecue or, or to come over or, or maybe for them to come to you when they're hurting or broken. Just knowing people's names and knowing them. You know, you're, you're not just somebody that's in my way. You're the person that God has placed in front of me. And that, there's a deep thing there in knowing people's names. The second step to that, kind of a, a, an evolution of knowing people's names, is to start praying evangelistically for them. It's a basic one. As you know people's names, I think about this girl at the, there's a coffee shop in, in Southern California. Her name's Lauren. I had a great conversation with her about a week and a half ago, uh, maybe two weeks ago. But, um, but I just think about her, and I think about, like, Lord, I pray that you would bring people in Lauren's path. I'm one, sure. Uh, but I can't pull her aside and give her 30 minutes of gospel presentation, but you have a lot of resources. I'm just one of them. Lord, raise up other resources. Raise up people, billboards, you know, little pieces of scripture blowing down the sidewalk when she walks. I don't know what it is, but I know her name, and I want her to know you. So just pray evangelistically about the people that you start to get to know as you reach out to know names. Maybe it's your server, your barista, whoever it is. Uh, number three, this is an easy neighbor one, is to offer help. When you, you hear somebody that's just having a rough go, you know, maybe, maybe you see people moving a, a, a fridge into their house or a couch into a truck, and they're like about one person short. And, you know, this is not for everybody in this room, obviously. I don't expect you to go and grab couches for people, but those that can, uh, for myself, that's an easy way of like, hey, do you need a hand? And people are usually shocked. Like, you want to help me carry my couch? And the answer is not really, but you look like you need it, you know? Uh, just, just offering help in those things, opening up those opportunities for a conversation. Who knows where it'll go? Who knows how much what you say will mean to them? But just offering help. Uh, the fourth one would be speaking graciously. This, this is easier uh, or, or maybe more common in person than it would be online. I think online we can be a lot less gracious to people, a lot more cutting, a lot more brutal. Um, but, but speaking graciously to people. And that doesn't mean everything you say is super nice, nice, fluffy, or whatever, but it means offering a perspective from a position of kindness and grace, 
not making assumptions, and certainly not pitting people against you, uh, because the idea here of Jesus coming to us from heaven was to rescue. He didn't come here to correct. He came to save. With that salvation comes a reshaping and a reforming, but that's his work. Our work is to open that door and to create those opportunities where we can relationally engage with people. This is an easy one, especially here. I think in Susanville, you guys will all have this down. Uh, in Orange County, it's a little more uh, of, a, of a focus because there's so many places you can go, but the fifth one would be to be a regular somewhere. I like haunting the same coffee shop because I want to get to know the baristas there. I, I, I want to. It's an active desire. I want them to know me, and I want to know them because I want to build that relationship where now when I walk and they say, hey, George, how you, how you doing? And there's an opportunity for me to return that question. How are you doing? You know, we got a second here. How's it going? You told me about your grandma last week. How's she doing? You know, and just building those relationships, being a regular is a really, really easy way. Number six uh, invite people to your home for food. And I don't mean for a secret gospel presentation. I just mean for food. Because the Lord will use those opportunities to open up great conversation, whether it's about hurts and brokenness, whether it's about philosophy and worldview, or whether it's simply about, man, what's up with you? You're so nice, and you get to talk to them about the nice Jesus that you serve. It's just a, a really, really easy opportunity, but as we see in the Gospels, Jesus engaged in this one powerfully, regularly, all the time, uh, eating food with people. So um, having personal and professional integrity is a big deal. You guys are the representatives of Jesus. You're his ambassadors, and uh, when you're skimping on your taxes or when you're not paying for the work that uh, the contractor did in your home right away, or you know, just having integrity when you've agreed to do things, um, you're reflecting the kingdom that you belong to. And if you belong to a kingdom of greed, it's really obvious. If you're belonging to a kingdom of grace, of joy, of forgiveness, of generosity, all of these things that we expect to receive from Jesus, he's hoping that you reflect that out to the people that you're dealing with. Uh, prioritize. Uh, number eight, prioritize the kingdom of heaven over earthly kingdoms. Um, maybe, again, this sounds very, very basic, but you guys, we have, we have one loyalty. There's a lot of things that we can have an affinity for, but we can only direct our passions toward one kingdom. This is a tough one. It really is. But the kingdom we, that we belong to is a kingdom whose builder is God. This is a different sort of kingdom. It's an upside-down kingdom built on service, not on power. It's, it's, it's built on love, not over domination and force. And those sorts of kingdoms, guys, those kingdoms prevail on this earth. Anytime you turn on your TV, the kingdom of men, Jesus would call it like the kingdom of, of, of Gentiles, the way they exercise authority and dominion. That's not the way that Jesus wants us to exercise authority and dominion. We are of a different kingdom. And as such... Uh, I'm not the rabbi. Pastors aren't the rabbis. Guys, Jesus is the rabbi. We're all the disciples. And that's just how it is. We serve one master, and that's Jesus. One kingdom, and that's his heavenly kingdom. So focusing on that kingdom. And then uh, the last one. This seems obvious, um, but this is really key because a lot of times with this idea of relational, missional Christianity, we can lose the central focus of why Jesus came. And it wasn't to make friends. It wasn't to have meals. All of those things are powerful and needed and a, and a part of the process of bringing people into relationship with the Father through Jesus. That's why he did everything that he did. And as we talk about all of these things, knowing, serving, and loving people are wonderful things to do that'll make people feel really good, but it's not enough as a missional Christian. That's simply not enough. Missional Christians know that, the, that God's mission is to redeem people, and he's using you to do it. And that's not just to make people feel happy. That's not just to help them. Those things, uh, uh, being a, a friend, being a neighbor, serving, all of those things must come with this, but they can't come alone. There has to be that salvation message, that gospel message coming through what you do. So I want to finish up with... A final verse here. A final passage is Romans chapter 10, and then I'll close. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 to 17. And this is usually kind of this, this ordination and sending passage for ministers, which as we just clearly defined, is you guys. 
This is your or, or, ordina, ordination and sending passage now. Think about your communities, your jobs, your neighborhoods, your families. It says, how then will they, the people that don't know God, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed and who has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the words of Christ. Guys, people need those words of life. They need it. And God put you right where you need to be to share it. And not just to share it like because, you know, by default that's what you do. But guys, the truth is he has given you the tools and made you the person, the right person to share it in power and in love. That doesn't mean in preacher voice and in love. That means in genuine, transformed, grateful life. Because that's exactly what you guys experience. So you can turn that and share that with the people that need it most. Will you guys pray with me? Jesus, thank you. Thank you for not only coming and rescuing us and setting us free and breaking our bonds, but Lord, um, you partner with us, which is an incredible thing. It's an incredible opportunity. In a sense, you've given us the badge and the gun. You've, you've given us the map of the city. You've even placed us right where we need to be most effective in. Lord, open our eyes. Help us to see those opportunities. Help us not to walk past because we're busy or we're blind or we're distracted. But I pray that you would give us an eagerness, an eagerness to love the people in our community in Jesus' name. In a love that would lead to them being set free. So Lord, I pray that you would empower your people. Holy Spirit, come upon the people in this room. Fill them to overflowing so that everything they do would be marked by the Spirit of God, by the love of Christ, by the rescuing love of the Father towards this broken earth individually, one person at a time. We, we pray that you would bless in Jesus' name. Amen.
In you there's life. In you there's life everlasting. In you freedom for my soul. In you there's joy unending joy. And I will Gracious Father, we thank you for speaking to our hearts today. Lord, we thank you for the encouragement, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the, 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 the conviction, Lord. We, we thank you for just being here in our midst and, and guiding us, Lord, by your Spirit. And help us to go out, Lord, and to, to live that, that missional life. Lord, help us to share you with everyone we know. Help us, Lord, that, that you would be glorified in the life of your servants. We love you so much, and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. <clears throat> and keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. Lord lift up, the Lord lift up <laughs> his, countenance his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Well, I know you guys are blessed today. Go out and practice what you learned. God bless you. If you need prayer for any reason, come on up. We'd love to pray with you. Have a good day.